Thank you for the introduction, John. Uh, my name is Brad Fessler. Uh, I am the uh, professional development and content manager here at Spira. And uh, I'll be working with you folks today to go through some Bolt things and get connected to a robot and learn uh, just the very basics about Bolt. While we're introducing, though, I would like you to please in the chat enter your name, your title, your email address, and your district, and just submit that in the chat, just so we know where everybody's from. Um, and there, obviously, we're all from Maine, not Lindsay and I, but the rest of us in participating, right? Um, but having all of that information in there, just so you build that, that community would be really super helpful. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask uh, Lindsay to introduce herself for just a moment. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay DeLong. I am the Education Partnership Manager for the Northeast. So I am your um, main contact for really anything you need to support you through this MLTI process um, with Sphero, but also just moving forward. So if you have questions about any of our products or curriculum or professional development um, options for the future after the DOE offers all of theirs. Um, if you have questions about ordering, if your district did not purchase their Sphero um, uh, labs yet, um, you know, I will help you with that. If they did, most people did. Um, if they did and you have questions about anything else invoicing, um, please reach out to me. If I do not know something, I will absolutely get the answer for you. Um, I will put my contact info in the chat as well for you. Um, so you have it and feel free to reach out at any time. All right, thank you, Lindsay, I appreciate it. I'm going to put that contact info up here just real quick. Spotlight my screen for you all. There is okay. Lindsay. Oh, contact actually, info. actually, wait, Brad, you spelled my name wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me fix that. <laughs> it's A Y. Oh, sorry. I it's did. okay. It's okay. But it does matter with the email. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> and I know better, and I still did it. I'm I know. I know. Spelling it the other way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Leave that up there for just another second or two. That way, if anybody needs it, it's there. Okay. All right. So our objectives for this session here today, um, hopefully we can develop some confidence programming using some block programming. It's really important. Um, find some activities and of course have some fun. So if you have a Bolt robot in front of you, that would be the best thing. And um, while I'm going through the beginning things here, if you didn't already download the Spiro EDU app, please start doing so now, all right? Um, just as a note, it is compatible with almost all platforms, uh, iOS, Android, Chromebooks, Windows, Mac. Um, so it's it's pretty accessible there. So please make sure that you download that if you didn't already do so, all right? So if we had more time, we would actually do all of this, but um, with this number of people in this short of time, I want to explain uh, this neat little activity that you can find in Sphero EDU. Um, it's called getting to know you. And uh, what I always did with students is I always try to um, get my students hands on as quickly as possible, right? If you take too long before you get them in there and get them doing something, you start to lose the student, right, in the classroom. And they, they're no longer interested in what's going on. So we don't want that to happen. We want our students uh, paying attention, being involved, being active participants in this. So I do this getting to know you where they introduce 
themselves, right, as an icebreaker, where they toss Bolt from one person to another. And then um, when they catch it, they're given 30 seconds. Bolt does all kinds of cool, fun things in there to um, make that uh, fun for the students. So it gives them that countdown. It gives them uh, uh, vibration to let them know that it's over. It plays um, animation for that countdown. It does all kinds of fun things that way in there. And I'll pull up my program here for just a second. So this is what that program looks like in here. It is super simple. So you can see very basic. And like I said, you don't have to like quick make a copy of this because it is in Spiro EDU for you already. Just a fun way to get your students hands-on super quick. So when I go to connect to a robot, there are a couple different ways to connect to a robot. I can hit my start button from inside of here and it will ask me to connect. This is what happens if you forgot to connect to a robot beforehand or when you're at the main part of the program uh, interface up here inside the app, you can go up to the top right corner and search for robots. If yours doesn't automatically go to Bolt, it might ask you what kind of robot. No problem. You're all connecting to Bolts. You're going to click on Sphero Bolt, and you're going to see all of the uh, Bolts show up for you. Now, pro tip number one for the day, right? You have 15 robots in a case, and they all have names like this, like sb dash. 2115, right? Which doesn't mean a whole lot when you're looking at a bunch of round robots. So we like to use what we call the Harry Potter method, right? Of the robot chooses you, you don't choose the robot. So class management tip here, bring your uh, students one by one with their programming device. The first student searches for robots, they click the top one, it doesn't matter how many bars of signal it's showing there. Click on the top one. It'll light up in the case. They grab that. The next student comes up. They search for robot, robots. They grab the top one. Boom. And keep that process going. It makes it very quick and simple versus, oh, you have my robot. Oh, you're driving my robot, right? It gets the, uh, that can be really daunting at first if that's what you do. So Harry Potter method when connecting multiple robots. Good news is I only have one robot powered on, so mine's pretty easy, right? I click on my robot. It's going to connect to my bolt. My bolt will light up, and my uh, device will do the happy dance here. And I now have my robot connected. And when I run my program by clicking on the start button at the top, right? Now, I just saw the question go through the chat. Can I roll this instead of tossing it? Well, we're using sensors for this. So rolling it's not going to set it up. So I'm going to shake it to simulate throwing it, right? So now you can see my robot is giving me a nice little countdown. And while it's counting down, I'll give you my quick introduction here. Sorry if you were in the last session. Uh, my name is Brad Fessler, product content. Uh, uh, yeah, try that again. Uh, content and professional development manager here at Sphero. And I spent 15 years in grades 9 through 12, uh, technology and engineering, and five years in higher ed. You can see my robot just shook, and now it's saying toss me, and it's waiting for the next person to catch it. Now, that being said, you're worried about tossing this thing, right? I don't want to break it, right? I don't want to break it. So if you look, I have this like tile floor here, right? Not exactly the softest surface that's in here, right? Well, my Sphero. Yes, you just heard that. Yes, my Sphero is now counting down in the corner of my room. I don't think it'll be on camera over there. Nope, it's in the corner. Um, but it is counting down. And I have probably done that with that particular robot no less than 300 times since I've owned that robot. Um, these things are super durable, 
Now, should I go outside with it and spike it on the concrete sidewalk? Yeah, that's probably a bad idea. Like, you get, there is a limit. It's not indestructible. And you can hear it just vibrated um, and is rolling around on my floor on its own right now. So um, think about uh, what you do uh, with these. They are extremely durable. So tossing it, not a big deal. If you are worried about the student um, tossing it in a room because of damaging other things, have them hand it to the other student and give it a shake. Um, giving it a shake will simulate it that, that collision that the app is looking for, that the sensors are looking for, and you're good to go. Okay. So fun way to get your students started with this. All right. That being said, there are multiple ways to program a robot. So when you get into uh, the Spiro EDU app, you can um, go in there and there's three uh, types of canvases. We have the draw canvas, which is that early elementary level where we're literally just drawing lines on the screen and the robot's going those directions. Super easy to get started, but not super precise because how far I draw on the screen doesn't really tell me how far it's gonna go in real life. I could draw a line that's three inches long on my screen. Bolt's not going just three inches. Bolt's gonna go a lot further than three inches depending on the speed that you set. So fun to get started. There's some cool activities that go with it, but we wanna progress past the draw canvas and get into the block canvas. And block canvas can take you from um, those elementary levels all the way through high school. I used to do block programming with my high school students, as well as then later text programming with my high school students. So today in this session, we're gonna deal with block programming. That text coding is Java, right? And that is meant for those middle to high school level students. If they progress through block, they've had that experience, you have the, a great setup um, in your state where you're starting your elementary students with Indy. So they're getting these concepts early in their educational career. So they're building a great foundation. And then they're going into this where they, now they're ready for block. And then you can get them into text coding and going through there. So it's a matter of when you start a new program, name the program, choose what canvas you want, draw block text, choose the robot you're using. In this case, it'll be a Sphero Bolt, and then you're ready to start um, programming, right? So let's take a look at block programming. So how do we create that very first block program. So remember, I said this is an interactive session. So if you've downloaded the Sphero EDU app already, open it up. And on the left-hand side, you'll see programs. Right? So you have home, activities, and programs. And when you click on programs and my programs, you'll see I have a few in here. Um, I kind of played around with this once or twice before, right? right? So um, you might not have any programs in there. Maybe you already played around with it as well. If you don't, no big deal. In the bottom right corner, you'll see that little green circle with the plus sign there. If I hit that plus sign, I'll get that dialogue that we saw earlier where we name our program. So super important, get your students in this habit right away name your program, okay? Or you will have Untitled Program 1, Untitled Program 2, Untitled Program 3, Untitled Program 4, and then the student's going to go, I don't know which program was which, right? So get them to name it and name it something that makes sense, because that's other things that my high school students used to love to do, is name it random things and then ha have a clue at the end of the semester when they had to come back and find something, what was where, right? So make sure it makes sense, right? I'm gonna use a very creative name here, demo, because I'm gonna demo this to you. And uh, I'm gonna choose the block canvas that's here. And then I'm gonna make sure I choose Bolt. If you choose the wrong robot here, you can always go back and edit 
that, but know that like Rover and Rover Plus have different blocks than Bolt, right? And Bolt has different blocks than Spark Plus, okay? So make sure you're choosing the correct um, robot so that you get the correct um, coding canvas for that particular robot. Once you have that, hit Create, and we are now in our coding interface. So inside of our uh, coding interface here, we have a bunch of categories, right? So our block canvas is divided into uh, categories across the bottom. We have movements, lights, sounds, controls, operators, comparators, sensors, communications, events, variables, functions. We're gonna go over every single block right now. And I got no reaction. Absolutely not. You'll never go through every single block in and out. <laughs> I it's was like, impossible. wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody was happy they were muted because they were saying something under their breath, right? Um, no, that you'll never get through all of those categories. So don't go down that road with students, right? Teach them what they need to know for that activity and then build on it, right? Um, think about how you're going to go through there. If you need help, help figuring out what all of these categories do. That little um, three dot menu at the top, if you've been watching my animated GIF, when you click on that, it says block canvas help. It's built right into the app. All of your categories are right in there. You can see different things. You can click on those block types um, and an overview of how all of this works, okay? So it's all there. You don't need to know all of it, to get started. So that's really um, pretty important as you go through. So let's get things rolling, literally get it rolling, right? So we're gonna add a roll block onto this on start event and actually get our bolt to move. So I'm gonna switch back over to my iPad here. And under the movements category, which should be the default one at the bottom left, I'm gonna grab the very first block and drag that up here and it's the roll block. And I'll zoom in so it's a little easier to read. There are three components to a roll block. We have our heading, which is the direction we're gonna travel. We have our speed, which is how fast it's going to roll, right? So that goes from zero to 255. Or if you flip it, it'll go zero to negative 255 if you want to roll in reverse, right? And then you have the time, right? So distance is figured out by speed and time, okay? So if I want to move um, two feet, I need to figure out how long it's going to take to do that at whatever speed I set. So probably one of the most common questions I get is, hey, Brad, how if I want to move one foot, what should I set my speed and time for to go to one foot? And I go, yes. That doesn't sound like a real answer, right? Because I can't answer that. I have a pretty smooth floor here. It's tile, right? If you ran this on a rougher surface or on carpet or things like that, you're going to get a different result, right? So it is purely an experimentation. So what I do with my students is I have them figure it out, right? I give them a distance, put a piece of tape on the floor. If you have a tile floor, you might have tiles that are one by one or things like that, right? And have them figure out, I want you to go from one edge of the tile to the other edge of the tile and let them experiment with this block to figure out what it is. Now, when I did this with my high school students, I would say set it at a moderate speed. Max is 255, right? So most high school students, all right, I got you. I'm going to set it to 250, moderate speed, right? So here's what happens, right? Again, I was dealing with high school students. If you're not dealing with high school students, you need to think about, you know, what, how you can uh, relate this to students here is, Hey, you got in a car and you put the car in drive and you just stood on the gas pedal, put it right on the floor right away, right? 
what's the car going to do? It's going to spin the tires, right? If it has traction control, it'll eventually stop spinning the tires, right? If it doesn't, it's going to spin the tires and then it's going to start moving forward eventually, right? Bolt's going to do the same thing, only Bolt doesn't have traction control. So Bolt's going to spin a lot until it gains enough traction to keep going, right? So if you're working with younger students, maybe give them a number, right? So if you can see, I have this slider here, I can slide this up and down to set a speed. But if you click on the number itself, it'll bring up that speed and you can enter a value. So I could enter maybe a hundred, right? And tell them, set your speed to a hundred. And I want to, I want you to figure out how far you can go by changing your time, right? So if I set my time to one and I set my roll uh, or my speed to a hundred, and I set my heading to zero, it's going to roll forward at a speed of 100 units for one second. Now, remember, I tossed my bolt. And it's now in the corner of my room. So I could get up and go over there and do that, but I've been moving a lot today. So I'm going to, instead of doing that, I'm going to drive my bolt, right? So to do that, up in the top right corner, we have aim, we have drive. That's kind of that middle one that's over there. You can set your speed for that and then move your joystick and Bolt's going to start to move. So if I switch my camera, we can now see Bolt. I'm now driving my, my Bolt kind of like a radio controlled car through there. So I moved Bolt where I want it. Also note that if I want to change Bolt's color, I can drag this color wheel, right, to get that um, the way I want it. Right, so I can move this and I can change that color. I can change the brightness and here's how I can move that robot. Now, it's also important to aim that robot. So I went into here and if we look, there's one blue LED turned on right now. So I'm gonna aim it by changing this dial and the way I tell my students to do it is stand behind the robot and the direction, look the direction you want it to, to go and aim that blue light at you because it's the tail light, right? It's the back of the car, if you will. So now with that being done on my iPad, I can hit the start button up at the top here and we're gonna see my robot move. So I'm gonna hit my start button and Bolt's gonna roll. And I'm going to jump back over here to my iPad. And you can see that my bolt moved approximately 63 centimeters. I'm seeing that live data fed back to my uh, programming device. There's one caveat to that. If you're using our app on a Windows computer, Windows does not allow that live data to come back currently. So if you're using a Windows computer to program, you're not going to see the the data live. You can download it after the fact, but you cannot see it live. So here you can see that live data. You can see the gyroscope through this, right? So you can see all that data, that accelerometer, the velocity of that in your different axes, the distance it's traveled in those different axes, right? So it's really pretty cool. It can act like a sensor as you go. All right. So let's take a look at programming this to move in a square. So I want you to take what we just learned with the roll block. We're going to take about uh, maybe five, six minutes, something like that, and try to program a square using four roll blocks. All right. Give you folks just a few minutes. Go ahead and try and program that. If you don't have a robot in front of you, but you have the app, still try to program it, and I'll give you some feedback here in just a moment.
All right, we'll give everyone about two more minutes, two more minutes. Okay, did anyone uh, figure it out? What changed between all four roll blocks? If we're making a perfect square, what should have changed in all four roll blocks? Yeah, Gretchen says the heading, yes, perfect. So let's take a look. Here's what I have, right? So I'm starting zero degrees, that means I'm gonna go forward. The next one, I'm gonna turn 90 degrees, right? So that'll make me turn to the right. Notice I added this cool little thing over here called a comment. That's what this, uh, where it says turn right, that's a comment. And to add comments to a block, if you long press or press and hold on it, you'll get that pop-up menu that says add comment. Then you can type things in there. That is super, super helpful for, um, troubleshooting a student's program. Type in that plain language. What is this block doing in there? Um, when you get into text coding, I tell my students they must have comments in there because if I walk up and they ask me a question and I they don't have any comments in there, I go, I have no idea what your code is doing. They're like, don't you teach this? Yeah, I do, but I have no idea what you did and what method you took to, to solving this problem. So add comments in. And nine times out of, out of 10, when a student would go through and make put all their comments in, they'd all of a sudden realize the mistake they made and they could fix it. Um, if they didn't, then I could read through and at least understand what they were trying to do and fix that, right? So let's take a look at how Bolt handles this. So I'm gonna hit my start button. And Bolt's gonna roll. All right. Yeah, pretty cool. Except if you look at my data here, does it really look like a square? What? What's kind of weird about that square? See some hand motions in there. What? What? What's what's with the square? It was more like a circle. Yeah, it gave me those rounded corners, right? Give me those rounded corners. So the important thing to do here is be patient, right? We want to add a delay. So let's think about how a computer processes a program. It reads a line of code and it does it. And then it reads another line of code and then it does it, right? Well, as this computer is reading that line of code of roll forward, it didn't have enough time to finish doing that, doing that actual action before it turned and went another direction, right? So the best way to fix this is to add a delay and that is under the controls category and if i take my delay block and i drag it into here and i'm just going to make mine one second and i'm going to do that between all of these just like that now yes my program got longer in this 
but I bet you we have a more effective program. So when I switch back here, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna aim my robot because right now, look, I'm facing the wrong direction. I'm gonna run into the wall if I do this. So I need to set my, this is not easy to do via camera, there we go. All right, set my directions that we're good to go. And now I'm going to hit start. All right, notice how Bolt went that direction, stopped, waited that time, turned, and then went and did that next block, right? So adding that delay made that much more accurate. Now, if I told that delay to be like two seconds long, would my lines get maybe even a little more crisp? Yeah, probably, because Bolt's not gonna rock around quite as much or slow it down right, to become more accurate, but that created a uh, much better square as we go through there. Now, just like us, our robot should have some style, right, and there's a couple of ways we can add some style. This is fun for students. They want to have their own style with their robot, is add some lights and some sounds, and Bolt has a lot of options when it comes to lights, and a couple different sound blocks when we go through here. So if we are looking at um, our app, we can go into lights and we can tell it, um, you know, every time it does a roll here, change colors, right? And we can go through here, change that color, right? And add that style to things, all right, just to get some cool effects there. And if I'm doing sounds, I can have it speak a sound where I actually drag this in and have it speak something, all right? So I can tell it um, what I want it to say. And add that to the beginning. And then maybe every time it turns, I want it to play a uh, random sound, right? So let's have it play a random sound. And what I could do is tell it to continue. That means it will run the next line of code while it's playing the sound. If I tell it to wait, it's going to, oops. if I tell it to wait, it's going to play that sound and then not do anything else until the sound is done, right? And at the end, it won't matter. And if I don't want it to play something randomly, I can go into that category. And there are tons of categories in here, um, you know, that you can go through here. You can do all kinds of different things and set specific ones. It just makes it a whole lot of fun. So that being said, I'm gonna re-aim my robot and check out my style here as I go. And let's go. Right, so you can do some really cool, fun things there um, with getting uh, the students to add some style to their program. These are the very basics, getting it moving. You can have them navigate a maze. Um, you can have them, uh, as you'll see, tell a story about different things and do things like that. But these are the very basics of those movements, those lights, those sounds. And don't forget about the delay because the delay is super important. Now, this was fun, cool. We learned a little bit of programming, but it's not just about programming. You can teach other concepts with these robots at the same time. So you can talk about the science, the technology, the engineering, the arts, the math, the language arts. You can integrate this into anything. 
anything. At my high school, uh, I live in Pennsylvania and uh, not all that far from Hershey, Pennsylvania. So we have Hershey Park is there. We, our physics club would grab a couple Sphero bolts. We would write programs for them. A student would um, take a bolt with them to the park. They'd put the robot in their pocket, uh, zip it up. They'd put their phone in their pocket. They'd run the program, zip it up, and then ride, ride a roller coaster. And then at the end, they would stop the program and save the sensor data and then rebuild the roller coaster as a class using that data. So really pretty cool things that you could do um, doing that. So tons of different things um, that you can do. Be creative as you go. So storytelling with Bolt is a fun one. So this is an example. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to do this. One of the materials at the moment in front of us to do this, but get students to write a short story here and use a chart similar to what you're seeing here and plan their story, the movements, the lights, and the sounds for each part of that story. So you can tell some, some really cool and interesting stories. If your students are capable of writing their own story, have them write their own. If um, they're not quite at that level, you can have them use a story that they already know and just kind of dissect part of it into here and do that. And you can have students work together collaboratively to have multiple characters in the same story. So each one is programming a bolt for to be a different character in that story whole lot of fun. Those of you that were in the indie training earlier, I referenced a very similar kind of activity with indie. Bolt just gives you that much more control to be able to do that. And we've all had that student that's in there that you know they are super creative and um, they can do, uh, they can write, they can do all of those things, but they will not speak in front of the class. We've all had that kind of student, right? Here's a great way for them to show their creativity and their skills. Have the robot speak it, right? Have the robot speak it. Eventually, as they're getting into it, you can coax them into doing those things, right? Don't let that one little thing that they just don't want to do be the reason that they just stop doing things, right? You know, work with that student. Eventually, you'll get them to a point where they can they can do this all together. So here's an example. This was an example I did for a training uh, not that long ago. They wanted to talk about earthquakes in their training. So we did the storytelling and we talked about earthquakes. And this particular example used two different bolts. Um, we made uh, a bolt um, that just drove around, right? Pretty simple. Um, the next one we had bolt shake where it vibrated and bounced around everywhere. So we use that raw motor control that's under uh, the movements tab. And then uh, we had it display an animation using the lights. And then it said, take cover under the table. And then it, another bolt ran underneath the table. We built like a little like popsicle stick table and bolt ran underneath and hit under the table, right? Uh, and then that last part. So you can see how you can do uh, integrate this. You're bringing in the ELA skills. If you're talking about the earth sciences here, talking about that earthquake or safety kind of thing, right? You can bring all of those topics together in one activity um, in a cool, fun, engaging way. All right. So let's talk about um, some hour of code things here, because Hour of Code is uh, this week, right, was CS um, week here, and Bolt has an activity uh, out there for Hour of Code. It's at the bottom left of your screen is the URL there, so uh, if you type that in or if you go in, I think they're featured in our app right now, and, and search RGB color or filter using Hour of Code, you should be able to find this activity um, and you take bolt in this and bolt becomes a color mixer. So as you tilt bolt in any of the three axes, right? So uh, roll, pitch, and yaw, those three axes 
are controlling red, green, and blue. Thanks, Chris, for throwing that link in there. I appreciate it. Um, that those three axes are there. And I've had a lot of teachers ask, what, what do those things mean? What does uh, you know, pitch, roll, and yaw mean, right? So uh, for my job, I get to fly on an airplane quite a bit, right? So if you can think about my hand as the airplane, right? Um, when we talk about pitch, right? We're lifting the nose or dropping the nose of the aircraft. If we're talking about roll, we're banking the aircraft to turn left or right. And then yaw is that scary moment when you're about to land and that sideways wind flows the aircraft a little sideways. If you're a YouTube person and watch these things on YouTube, you'll see it. And the aircraft will actually kind of be flying through the air kind of somewhat sideways like that. Um, that is yaw, right? So we can control all three of those axes um, with our robot and each one of those axes is linked to a value of red, a value of green, and a value of blue. And we're mixing all of those things together, which is really um, fun and cool way to go through and, uh, and learn about not only color, but all those axes and how, how that I am you part of the robot actually works. So with that being said, Bolt is by far um, more complicated than Indy. So those of you that were in the Indy training earlier, we didn't have a ton of time for questions, um, but I wanna leave a bunch of time here for Bolt. So just some of the things that I've noticed that uh, were in the chat, I saw there is one here that says, I'm wondering if there's a way to program multiple bolts to do the same thing, or if there's a way to connect multiple bolts to the same code. Okay, so um, yes, the short answer of that is yes. So one of the really cool things um, with our robots is this down here in the bottom right corner, this one category that says communications. And if you go in here into communications, you can actually get the robots to talk to each other, right? Now, they use infrared. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, like a TV remote control, like some of the newer ones are Bluetooth so that it doesn't apply. But um, on a lot of the older ones, right, you had to make sure that the remote was pointed towards the TV for it to work. That's how our robots are too. They have that infrared communication capability. And there's actually multiple sensors in there to send and receive those signals. So you can get them to do that. So the cool part is you can say, I want this robot to follow a robot that's on one of these channels, right? So if I program, we'll say the master robot, the first one, Right. Think about conga line here. Right. So we can have some fun and dance. Right. As we go through here. So we that person that's in the front, that's in the lead, that's the master robot. And then the others are following that master robot using that communication. So the master robot, you would program and then you would also tell it to broadcast. So we would broadcast on these channels using the master and then we would follow using the other ones. So two different programs for the robot, but they'll end up doing the same thing, right? Which is really pretty cool. And if you want them to evade each other, you can do that same concept. So instead of follow, you could tell it to evade. And then that evade is it's going to avoid it. So you can kind of play like a tag game with this and go through there. It's really pretty neat. You can even send messages where you could say, um, send this message um, on that channel with that intensity, right? It goes um, from one to 64. That's how strong that signal is. So how far the signal will travel. And when uh, the robot sees that message, it'll say, do this, you know, so do something something else, right? And what that might look like. So great question um, with that. Let me see, did I answer? 
Okay, so the second half of that question is, say you wanted to do a class project where students create a part of the code and then um, add it to a class project, right? So how would you handle that? So that's a great question. Um, say we're trying to solve this as a group and we, we're doing the decomposition part of a big problem and each stu smaller student group is taking a small problem and trying to answer that big one in the program. I would have each of them write their own program. And then from there, come together and debrief and put all of those together, right? So either you as the teacher or maybe like a, a student leader, right? Might put that together, um, take each individual program, put it together, and then let's test this and see how it works. So you test the individual parts and then you test it all together there. Um, but that's a great, great concept, great idea. All right, we got about nine minutes. Who has some questions? Nobody has any questions. We're all bolt experts. That's perfect. <laughs> so just to kind of recap a couple things here before I, I cut you loose um, here this evening is make sure when you're doing this, it's a hands-on experience for you and the students. Um, you can sit through this training um, a dozen times unless you power up that robot, open up a programming canvas, write a program and run it, you haven't really truly had that Sphero experience, right? So make sure you take the time to experiment with it, play around with it. Um, if you have questions on um, how the robot works or why my program doesn't work, um, my, my email address was in there. I'll put it in the chat uh, yet again. That way you have it. Um, feel free, send, just send me an email of like, hey, Brad, I expect this program to do this, but it doesn't. Um, you know, why? Uh, or how can I do this? And I'll gladly help you out when it comes to that. Um, if you're trying to still purchase and do that kind of thing, please talk to, to Lindsay. I can't help you on the purchasing side of things, but Lindsay's great and can, can handle all those um, questions that way. And if there's any last questions, if not, we'll cut everybody loose for the evening. Thank you for joining. Uh, I do really appreciate everyone attending. I know that uh, you know the evenings can be tough and we all have our own things going on. So I appreciate everyone coming in and uh, participating. All right, thank you everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.